I, I went for a walk in the woods and I saw a, a deer coming and it was coming to me and, it, and I couldn't tell what it was till it got to about 50 yards or so and, and it was a young buck it was a spike and he's walking and he's coming right at me and I said well this is kind of cool and I didn't really want to shoot him and I was working my way up the mountain but I let him come to me and as he was coming uh, I heard him grunt real soft. Now he was just ordinary deer just slowly strolling through the woods and he was grunting for what seemed like no reason. I, I couldn't understand it all that much. What's he grunting at, right? And because he's a spike and, and it's the rut, right, and he's coming, he's just walking nice and easy and uh, 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 every now and then. And it was really, really quiet. And, and I listen and I watch him come. Now I've come up the mountain and it's all hardwoods where I am and I'm standing there with my snow camo on. So I'm just a snowbank to him and we're in the wide open, like this room kind of wide open. And he walks right up about here to that chair from me. And my tracks are like here to that young man. And he's looking at my tracks and his nose is pumping a little bit and he sniffs that spot right there. And he didn't even have to go over to it. And he's like, there's something wrong. Now the wind is roaring right at me from him towards me. So he can't really smell me standing here, but he's looking and he's looking all around and he looks right through me. I'm white, right? So I'm a snowbank, and he doesn't even see me. And he's literally here to that chair from me. And I'm standing there with my gun on him. It's a deer, never trust a deer. And I've got that gun right on him and I'm just standing there and I don't want to shoot him. And he, he just stands there looking around and then for probably a 45 seconds, a minute goes by and he's looking down the hill and the snow starts in a little bit. And, and he brings up his cud and he starts chewing his cud right there. Um, rah, 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 rah. And he's chewing away and looking down the hill and he's looking around like, where's this guy? There's a guy here and he's still chewing his cud and he's looking at my tracks. And he's like, there's a guy here. I, I'm just going to stand here. So he chews his cud and swallows it and has some more and swallows it. And then just turns and starts walking and he's going to come by almost here to the computer. He's coming right at me. Now when you get inside of 10, 15 feet of a deer, ooh, be careful. Like that's really, really close. It's, it's da deer are dangerous. You've got to watch them buggers, right? And he comes right across and starts walking by me and goes by me, oh, here to pat from me. And then he, I wave my hand at him like that. And now he sees everything. And oh, I don't like this. And he starts to turn and he jumps a little bit and I grunt at him and his, his attitude instantly changes and his hair stands right up and all of a sudden he's got attitude and he just smelt a person and it totally changed my mind about calling and how calling can sometimes change a deer's mind like you wouldn't believe when they were pretty much going to leave and I was a little bit wow watch that and he turns on this attitude and all his hair stands up a little bit and now I'm back to pointing a gun at him again. You never know what he's going to do, right? And I'm watching him and he turns around and walks right back down those tracks with his eyeball on me and sniffs my actual track. Oh, I don't like that. He didn't like that. You could tell. I, this is not what I like. And he backed around and came right back. It made him come down, go back, and walk around within 15 feet of me. And as he started away up the hill, I waved at him again. And I said, I hope you live a long time. And he took right off and jumped. And he jumped about four jumps. I'm leaving, running real hard. And I grunted at him, and he boom, breaks back on, hair stood back up, and he came walking right back to me again. And now I believe in a grunt. I'm completely into grunt calls now because look what that deer did and how it stalled him and kept him around me, and I wanted to start using that all the time. Now when I get back home and I think about it that night, my brain is saying, how many times does a buck run up to another buck thinking and doing about the other buck? So if, say I'm a big buck and I'm laying on a mountain and here comes something and it's grunting. It's that spike horn. How many times do buck, bucks find other bucks? And especially during the early part of November when there's no does and heat yet, but they're feeling that I need to go look around thing. So I thought to myself, well, what if I 
if I, if I was a big buck, I'd have let that little bugger walk right up to me. Even if I didn't know what it was, I'd have seen the movement, heard the grunting. And if he was in straight leaves, I'd have still let him come right up to me if I was a great big buck. What if I go out and pretend I'm that spike horn and I walk right up to a buck doing that? He may, it may get me that extra 20 yards. It may get me around a corner. It may give me a chance, even if I stop him when he runs away. So I started calling and tracking. Now, a lot of times when you call and there's not a lot of deer around, you're calling to an empty house. You call, you rattle, uh, you grunt, you use a little tipper can. My, my, the boys love tipper cans. Them things work beautiful. So he tipped the tipper can. How many times do you play to an empty house when there's just no one around and you say, oh, this thing doesn't work. And then you don't use it anymore. So I, I thought to myself, if I'm tracking a deer and I can get within hearing range and He's not moving, say he's laying there, but I get close enough, so now I'm hunting him and I'm fairly close, and I give him a chance to get up and come looking for me, now I'm not moving and he is. That's one of the big advantages when you sit in a stand, like on a, in a tree stand or something like that. It's a big advantage to, to not move and have the deer moving, because then you can see them. Then buggers blend in, and this was my chance to have the deer move and me not move, and me see him, and now he's had to radish. Or let me hear him and now I'm willing to wait the extra 15 minutes it takes for me to find him and then get him, right? I, I can wait a long time, like Joe DiNino says, right? How long would you sit in a stand? Three hours, right? How long should I take a step? It, when you know there's a deer around and you're playing to someone, you're playing your call to a, a house that there's actually an audience, so I started doing that. Well, I started walking right up to bucks. They let me get right up really close. And even then, when they saw me directly, when they smelt me sometimes, they'd just jump off and I'd call and they'd stop. Or they'd come back and look to see. And it, get, it bought me sometimes two or three seconds. Sometimes it bought me two minutes. Sometimes it bought me five minutes of being around a deer. And I, I want, you want to buy time because you want to get the shot. So it started, this was started working so good for me that I just started calling, and I started calling a lot. And I thought to myself, can you over call? So I said, well, let's just try over calling. So I started calling and calling and walking and calling and just grunting and walking through the woods, calling, just keep trucking. And every time I thought I was getting close, every time I saw lots of deer tracks, the cover got thicker. It felt like I was going to be around some deer. I started calling plenty and I started bumping into a lot of deer. I started bumping them, right? I'd just get up there and boom, and off they'd go. And sometimes they'd stop. Sometimes they freaked. Sometimes they just ran away. Sometimes I think I scared them away. Um, some of my grunts were too big and too much. And here's this little spike horn, right? And you call to him like a giant 12 pointer and he goes, Ugh. like somebody screams at you on the street and says, hey, you go, what, what, right? So I started calling easy and gently and sound like friendly and call with the, a female voice, the tipper can, right? A real gentle, small, easy voice. I started doing that a little bit more and it bought me the extra coming around the brush to get the shot at the buck. I'm pretty sure he's right here or I see just part of the buck and I can't, can't quite decide if I should move or not. So now moving became a part of the play of learning when I called. So I started paying attention when I called and I watched deer's reaction to the calls and some deer don't want to hear what you got to say. They could care less. They just totally ignore me. And then there were others that just got super alert and worried and then if anything moved, they were gone. So the, I, I started learning when not to call and then also to how much to call and I started changing it up more and more and especially a lot of does would really freak and I started also too learning how much to call and when to call during the rutting situations before the rut, during the rut and after the rut and I also started using that information the same with moose. Uh, moose was another thing where moose call like crazy in the beginning of the rut and then they tone it down as the rut really gets going and then they'll be a little more gentler and quieter because it's attracting a lot of attention. I've had a lot of problems calling so they quiet down. If they hear this big huge hey, a lot of giant bulls were 
boom, gone. And I even practiced on moose that I saw. I practiced on deer off season. There was a doe out in the field and she's just feeding and minding her own business. I'd whip out a little fawn ball and I would just rah, rah, rah. And some of them were boom, gone. That's not my fawn. Mine's over here. That I'm out of here. This is not good, right? Then others were real dominant does would come charging down there and run right up to me trying to defend that fawn. So I started mixing up when I was calling and how much to call. And I started almost using my guts a little bit and being careful about it. And over time, you yourself will learn lots more different you have to have, you gotta try it, right? You gotta give it a try. So I started trying it more and more. And over time, people, even now that they've been watching like Grunt Buck, they've been watching some of those videos and they're asking me, well, when should I call and how much should I call? And we're like, just try it and learn. If you scare a few off, you start wanting to know more. It's almost like when you get in the new job and the old worker says, ah, oh, just go ahead, do some shoveling over here, right? And you learn, oh, there's rocks there. Yeah, mm, right, I knew that. They don't tell you all those secrets right up front. You have to learn a little bit on your own, make a few mistakes, and now you're a better listener when, when the old buck says, hey, try it this way. So those things were, were quite a deal for me, but I also started sharing them. And a couple of years ago, I had a fella, he's like, I, I listened to what you said. I went out and I found a giant buck track. I followed that thing. I got what I thought was pretty close to it. I called to it and it got up and walked right to me. And it was 268 pounds, 150 inches in Minnesota. You know, so he's like, I, I never would have thought to combine these two things in order to get a big one and be in the right place. And now it's paying off for me. And now I see how much it works. So over time, practicing a little bit, I've seen quite a few things where it's worked really well. And it's bought me a few time to get a little bit closer. One of the beauties of calling is that especially in thicker cover or blotchy cover. If I'm following a buck and it's fairly open and I can see an island of thick, a thick spot in the middle of the hardwoods or say a whole bunch of spruces and a little wet sag in the middle of it and there's a lot of cover and there's a pretty good chance that if there was a deer right in this 10, 15 acres, it would be right there and I need to go across this wide open, I'm gonna make a ton of noise and I need to go across there, but it'd be nice to not disturb it. And I know it'll run out the backside and I won't have a chance. If I pull up to that open area and now I call a little bit and I just wait, let's see. Um, say that that area is downwind of me. My wind is gonna blow right in there. Before I get there, before I wait too long for my scent to get down in there and spoil it for me, I'm gonna call a little bit right off the bat. I'll bust out, look at everything, and there's an island down there, and there's a good chance the track's right, there's a good chance that deer's right there. Hey, hey, couple, just a couple of butt grunts, nice and easy, just see what happens. Real short, little easy, not, not big aggressive shit, just real easy, just a little bit call to it and if it has a chance it's at least going to pay attention and it's going to be looking one of the downsides of calling is that deer know right where that sound came from that that's how they earn their living is knowing where that sound came from so they stand there and now they're as patient as i would have been if i knew they're there the, the big old buck's been there five years he'll go right there i'll wait especially if he's bedded He'll just stand there and stare and you've given away your spot. So sometimes calling can help you, sometimes it can hurt you. But if I walk straight at him, he may not still be able to figure out what I am. I have the profile of a deer when I'm going straight at you. If I go sideways, I look like a stick. Deer know the difference. When they see something coming straight at them, you, you kind of look like a deer. I'm not sure what that is. But as soon as you go crossways, they go, that is not a deer. Deer are long. That is not a deer. Boom. So a lot of times, if I, that island, I would go straight at that island. After I've called, I go straight at it and I pay attention. And if I can use any amount of trees to cover me a little bit, help break me up the terrain, use that to break me up and work my way down there. If the wind is a little one way, I'll try and protect myself a little bit and work my way down it. A lot of times, I think when I first started hunting, deer used the wind 
to make sure they didn't run into someone because there were so many hunters in the woods. The opening day of deer season when I was a kid was crazy. There was lots of deer, lots of people in the woods, and the deer were worried about running into people and they wanted to smell in front of them as they traveled. Since the coyotes moved in, and there's fewer hunters, they're now checking the back wind. They want the wind at their back. Dog coming, yep, right? And the coyotes are hunting them all the time, so deer will go with the wind quite a bit, especially in the big woods, they, they travel with the wind. And if I'm tracking them, I'm going with the, my wind blowing right down the track. I mean, and there's nothing you can do about it, it's gonna go. And if some places where it's kind of tight, or like in the case of that island, I don't wanna wait too long, because my wind is gonna go down there and spoil it. And I know it's gonna happen. You're never gonna fool a deer's nose. I don't care how much scent stuff you put on. It, you never fool a deer's nose. A dog nails a bunch of drugs in a warehouse in three plastic packages on the first walkthrough. You're not gonna fool a deer. You, you smell like a human and you can't stop smelling like a human. So I worry about that going down and spoiling it for me if I go too slow. So Joe will take his time as he's walking up to that buck one step at a time and hunt that. Sometimes I'll do that, but sometimes I won't because if I wait too long, the scent is gonna spoil it. So that, that's always a, a feeler out. But if I call to it and I go straight at it and I work my way down and it buys me half the distance and now he pops out of that and goes sideways and I keep shooting lanes as I travel through the woods, he's had the radish. Um, or at least I'm gonna get to see what he is. You know, it might be this and I don't want it. Right, might be not the horns I want, or the, the age of the buck I want, or there's multiple deer. And I don't want a deer, I don't want to shoot to spoil it. A lot of times does will spoil it for you, right? So I worry about that a little bit, but that's, that's part of the gig a little bit, and you'll have to practice it some, but the calling has worked so well that I don't not want to do it anymore. I, I want to do it all the time a little bit. The times it can spoil things is when your wind is fairly close. It can also be, say, I had to, uh, I'm sneaking along and I get right up to them. They've got a pretty good look at me and now he smells me and I call almost at the same time. Now he's associated my call with my smell and he's seen me, right? Now this is a whole new game. I know what you are, boom, and away he goes, right? And that downwind thing, and then usually shoot across an open area somewhere and stop at the edge of cover far off and watch and see. Now, if I go busting down through there real quick, it won't take long for him to say, yup, he's after me. Now he's a whole new, tracking becomes a whole new animal when you kick him up the first time and it doubles on the second time. And when you go to the third and fourth time, then it kind of maxes out at the fourth time. When you've gotten a deer and you've moved him four times, now he understands the drill. If it's a younger one, he'll probably go ballistic. And that's one of the reasons I don't like to track small deer is because they react like does. If you ever track a doe and she understands you're after her, she will show you the world. And she'll do it at about 140 miles an hour. Like she won't even look back and she'll do a mile hook right out and be on another ridge like three miles away <laughs> and then stand there for four hours and watch her track and see if you're coming. And especially if she has fawns with her, she has to watch out for them. I've got to pay attention. I've watched deer do that, come back to me, and the fawns have been standing there so long, they just lay down, and mom is still doing this. Four hours later, still watching, right? Young bucks have learned that from mom. Watch out. And a lot of our does, especially like in Vermont, they're, they, our average doe is a five-year-old. So they're really experienced. And if they're in an area like say Pittsburgh, New Hampshire, where they get tracked all the time, they run into people following them all the time, they're wise to tracking, and you bump them the second time, the third time, they're gonna show you the whole neighborhood. You're gonna go for a long, long run. And a lot of young bucks will go on this huge, high speed, long run with a stop somewhere and watch back. And if there isn't a big enough time for them to chill a little bit, Remember, they've always run for their life and it's worked. So they are pretty sure they can run for their life and then relax. Deer are used to running for their life 
and then stopping and getting bumped over and over. The bigger ones who have played that game stopped and then caught whoever was coming after them again. Now that call is not going to work. That call is going to give away your location and I'm not calling anymore. When, when I spoiled him a couple times on calling or I think I've spoiled him, I'm not calling anymore. I, I don't want to further educate him that day. Now it may work again in the future, but if anything, calling and tracking is only going to make legendary bucks. They're going to learn from all that calling and tracking, and then they're going to be less likely to come right to it because he's five now. Like that old bull, and he hears someone moose calling, he goes to the back and will let the ladies check that out. And the second the ladies say, and they, all of the, a big cow, all she's got to do is put the Put the radar on something and that them big giant 50 inch bulls, they go, yep, whoom. They don't even wait around. They don't wait around to find out. And a five year old can be the same thing with a deer, right? He's paying attention to what's going on there. He's watching these satellite deer. They all of a sudden have an issue. I gotta go. It won't take long. And that educating that they get over and over because you called to them and then busted them won't take long. When you go back the following year, doesn't mean it won't work then. If you come back, say, uh, you, you jumped him and did this to him in rifle season in the beginning, muzzleloader, he may very well fall for it. Because you've, he's, he's had a whole bunch of nighttime deer activity with grunting and chasing and does, and he's used to it again, right? And you come up and grunt a little bit, he's like, boom, maybe that's so-and-so. And all the bucks generally in an area know each other fairly well. They know each other. They've run into each other somewhere along the line and they know the drill. So sometimes the calling will come back in. Sometimes the deer's mood is all, another, another time I measure whether to call or not. If I'm following a buck and he's going nice and easy, he's walking slow and gentle, say it's early. It's um, pre-rut November 7th, right? The, first, the end of the first week in November, which he's been sitting around he feels like laying down some sign. There's no doze and heat yet. And I just feel like doing something and it's warm during the day, but at night it's cool and I'll go over and pound some trees. Any amount of sign you find in that first week in November, the deer's right there someplace. He's close by, usually within three, 400 yards or wherever that sign is, that deer's right there someplace. So the first week in November, I always hunt sign. That's also a time when calling may work very good. It'll start to work, but He'll also, hmm, who's this? And there's no urgency about getting in an altercation because there's no doze and heat yet. There's nothing really quite happening yet. If it's a dominant deer, he may very well want to come and see what, what the, I heard somebody over here, a few sticks break, um, there's a little bit of movement, and now there's a couple grunts. He may say, okay, let's see who it is. And he'll go downwind, circle a little bit. <laughs> who is that, right? So a lot of early season calling, and especially if you're tracking too, will be a hook. The deer will try and hook you. He'll try and not get in an altercation. I don't necessarily want to fight, but I want to see who this is. And he'll swing and he, sometimes you'll get a shot, like if he's fairly close and he just needs to check out who you are and he gets up and moves. Now you got a chance. I always try and take advantage of that and it'll work, especially if you're in real close proximity. If he's a long, long ways away, odds are good. He's just not going to get out of bed and come 300 yards because he heard a grunt. They, they generally don't do that. Some bucks won't react at all, could care less. They can listen to a tipper can all day long and it's like you don't exist. I don't care. A lot of does will be that way too. Another time that I worry about calling and I've had calling mess me up is with the does when they're in heat and they're being chased by a buck. This is normally what happens with most of us when we're rifle hunting. We're hunting the main part of the chase phase of the rut, right? November, the second week in November, the third week in November, and there's a lot of chasing going on. The majority of Vermont's deer um, come into heat, our, our does come into heat on November 22nd, seems to be the peak. Vermont measures when the fawns are born by roadkill. We measure the length of the fawn, and that says that the gestation period, when you go back to 200 days, is right around Thanksgiving. The two or three days is the peak rut for Vermont. Two, two days before Thanksgiving, the most does are in heat. But we've also had some does that were bred on the first uh, 
the first, I think it was October 6th or 7th, the first week in October at the end of it, we've had a few does that were actually bred then. So they'll start then and there'll be this gradual curve that'll work right up to November 22nd and then it'll start swinging off with a tiny bump. It's hardly even a bump in December at the second rut. There's hardly any of that at all. So the, the vast majority of the does, you know, in a, the 80 and 90 percent are being bred just around Thanksgiving. If we're we're hunting say the 10th to the 15th when when the Vermont opener is or um, like mass you guys here are a little bit later um, that that part of the rut when she's being chased by a buck and she's not in heat at that minute I've been many times where there's a doe she comes across the road like mr. T she comes across the road and she has two bucks in escort I come to the tracks I look at that and I say two bucks on a doe, ain't that beautiful? She's hopping and skipping, and the other smaller deer is hopping and skipping, going up the mountain right there, and then there's this great big hog on the back, and he's taking his time, but he's coming. He's steady, dunk, 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 dunk. The old man is steady and he's coming up the hill. This is a beautiful scenario, right? I look at this and I say two bucks, she isn't ready, and she's kangarooing pretty good at a pretty good speed. I follow them up the hill. They go quite a ways. She tries to dodge them a little bit. I, I watch her dodging them in the brush. She jumps into a bunch of brush and slows up a whisker and then comes out running, boom. She, she just doesn't, I'm trying to get rid of them. What she's really trying to get rid of is the four pointer. The four pointer is wanting her and she smells beautiful and I'm gonna get her. So he's chasing. Meanwhile, the big boy's coming up the back. She runs over the top of the saddle, starts out to the end of the saddle, spins around and comes running back. Something kept her from going over the front. She comes back about oh, 50, 60 yards and runs into the four pointer chasing her. So she goes out, comes back and jumps off because he's coming right over the hill. And she's like, oh, here we go. She swings out around and continues off on, onto the side of the saddle and continues over where she wanted to go. She didn't go here, but she went that way next to it. And the four pointer goes running right out through and runs past her track and says, oh, I missed her and comes running back and found where she turned off and now he joins. So I come to this intersection and I'm looking at the intersection and there's deer going everywhere and they're going this way, they're coming back, and they're going that way. And I'm thinking to myself, they're all over here. There's a stop sign out here. There was some kind of stop sign out there and all the deer stopped. The big boy makes the corner. I don't need to go out there and look. I know they went down, came back over here, boom. I, I don't even need to go and look, but I'm right on them. Like I'm gonna see them any minute. And she's already hesitant about going cross country. And I don't wanna call right now. I want to stay quiet. They're busy doing their thing. When deer are busy doing their thing and it, it could work to your advantage any second, I don't call. No calling right then. And I need to buy a minute and it's really thick where they went and it's kind of open on the other side and if I continue out to the dead end, I might as well. I, I'm, I should go here. Everything says go that way, but I'm like, no, I'm gonna go right over here. So I go right out to the dead end, sure enough, it's a dead end, and I just cut right straight in. I need no, no need to swing back and walk back on my spot. I swing into the woods, and sure enough, they've gone out straight. Now, what's about to happen? This is, this is really like textbook. They already went, mm -mm. what's gonna happen? They've been going cross country for a long ways. This is a doe, and she's being chased. What happens to does when they're chased? They go and then they come home. They don't live nine miles away. This is where I live. And she's left her living spot with these two buck and gone and she did a stop sign. What's gonna come out at the end of that? Another stop sign. And guess where Rodney's gonna be standing? And I'm thinking to myself, they're dead. They are dead because she's gonna go out there and say, nope, and she's gonna come right back. And she's going to give him the slip on that. It didn't work here, but she'll go around him out there. She'll make a hook and come back on her own track. I want to be standing on top of tracks all the time. 
especially as the season progresses, you want to be standing on tracks because deer use other deer paths all the time. And I want to be on their back track because she's going to go down there and lope and she's going to bring the whole show back to me. This is also when I don't want to call. I don't want to do any calling because when they get out there and she comes back, I don't want her to go, Rodney, whoom. I want her to come by me and bring the two boys with her right so I'm not calling I'm paying attention and I'm walking down that track I go a ways and I look and here comes a deer and I right I want to get off that on the downwind side so I move right off that track she's gonna come right through here and I step off to the side and I get my gun ready to go and she to chunk to chunk to chunk and she gets up to where my scent pool is right my smell is right here she comes right up to that scent pool and stops and says Ooh. And now she's looking around, she's paying attention, and I don't see any buck. I'm ready to go. I, I, I don't want to mess with her, but I got to pay attention because they, they're going to come kangarooing right through here any minute. And then I move right at her. Go on, go on, go on. And she goes, boom, and takes right off. Good. Now, let's get where I've got shooting lanes. I want to stand where I, I can see. That way they can't get by me because they're probably going to be doing 100, right? They're chasing her. They, and the, the small buck will definitely be doing 100. The bigger buck, probably not. They didn't do that for the last mile and a half. And they've gone about a mile and a half out of that doe's area. So she's going to want to go home. So here comes, I look and oh, here comes some legs and I get the gun right on it and I'm picking my holes and I'm getting ready to go and he boom, stops. And he's looking for her. Where'd you go? And he's, he's all happy. He's all happy. He's got what he wants. And, she, and he looks for her and she went this way straight away, right? Because I did this to her. But I wanted her to be gone before they showed up. So they have to look for her and I have more time. I don't want them to go speeding by me. So he's standing there and he's looking and he's almost in the scent pool of me right here. I'm a little worried about him blowing it because he could, he could snort and, and then blow and run off. And he could go sideways and the big one could swing to him thinking he's going to cut the corner and I won't get the big one, right? I don't want to do that. I don't want him to go busting off straight just yet. So he's standing there and he's looking around and he's literally here to the road from me. He's 15, 20 yards. And he's standing there looking away and looking where the doe went. Uh, and I call to him and he goes, boom. Now I call to him real nice and easy and small. I don't want to sound like the big boy in the back. He'll be scared of him and he'll run away again, right? I just want to hold him. You stay right here, boy. Then this thing can come running right into me. So I'm standing there watching and I'm watching him. And he goes, eh. little, little tiny, like that. Eh. And then he looks right at me and he starts stiff walking right towards me, hair standing up a little bit, and then he gets in the scent pool. And all of a sudden the hair lays right down, right? When they're aggressive, the hair stands up. All of a sudden his hair laid right down flat. And he lays right down flat and he's looking at me. And I said, next year, go on. And he to do this way. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. Uh, now I grunt. Now I want him to think I'm that four-pointer. And he's not going to like that four-pointer. He's trying to cut off his stuff. So now call, right? So I call good and hard. Go boom, 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 boom. I can hear the brush cracking and here he comes and he's coming right up through the woods and I can see rack a little bit and I'm ready to go. And he pulls right up and stops and he's behind a little bit of stuff and I can't quite get a shot. And I'm thinking to myself, well, I don't, he's only about 20 yards from where no man's land is. If he smells me right here, I'm definitely done. And I can't quite shoot really good right here. So now I snort wheeze him. I want him to think I'm that little buck and I'll take you on. He'll come running right over to me to kick that little bugger's butt, right? So now I snort wheeze him. He's just standing there. And all I can see is a little bit of the back of him and that's it. I can't see the rat, can't see, all I can see is just little pieces of him. And literally he's 25 yards, but I just, you know, so I'm standing there all ready to go and I see some brush move. Well, he's got a little tree and he's whacking it with his horns. So, oh, that's good. I give him another one. Snorwee's at him again. He's, this is what I can do to you, right? Like a bull on a tree, right? I can, I'll take you. He 
pops right up and he comes walking right out of that stuff and right out into the wide open here to the road right there 20 yards walks right out 220 eight pointer right head down ears cocked every hair standing up on that thing and he walks right out into the wide open and he goes up to another little sapling and he vroom, and I'm like, oh, you're done. You're so done. And I hate to shoot. Oh, I, I got to enjoy him for a minute, right? Because he's just standing there and I've got him right there. All of those times that will come to you, one of the other things that's really good is at when you want to call is when or just before you shoot, call right then. I jump a small buck. He goes a little ways, stops. I call to him and he stops. I shoot right after I call. The bullet goes through him and now he hears deer. I, he thinks I'm a deer because I just got done calling but I also shot him. He doesn't know where the sound came from. He doesn't know where the bullet came from. He knows he's in trouble. He just got shot but he thinks I'm a deer. Now he just right at me. What better thing, you, what better tip could you ever have than to call just before you shoot because the second you call to him and he thinks you're safety other deer are safety to deer so i've called to him now he just turns and comes right at me after i've shot him i'm like good come on over here right i got another one for you pow boom right so that's another time to call and here i've got this thing 220 beating up the tree i've just snort wheezed him twice and he's right there and he grunts and then starts threat walking me again. Now he can see there's something right here and I don't know what it is. He's dangerous. When you snort wheeze, you're picking a fight with a deer. Watch it. They could come right over and send you into the air like a rag doll. You've got to be very careful with deer. I've learned this, man, especially inside of 15 yards or so. Watch it because they'll give you a ride and you won't like it. He starts threatening walking me and coming towards me and I'm like, well, I gotta shoot him. He's, he's gonna kill me, right? And I just boom like that. Now, I, remember, I just got done calling to him and he thinks I am a deer. Where's that buck gonna run? He just keeps coming, right? Right, so that's another thing to keep in mind. So I shoot him and he comes right at me. Now I've gotta move and my gun's empty. First thing you do is load your gun. When your gun's empty, you reload it. It is a stick without bullets in it. I don't care if it's a muzzle loader, or whatever. So I throw another shell and I step back because he's really coming and he's coming right at me. And I back up a little bit and I shoot a lot. I do a lot of practice without aiming. So the thing's coming right up and I just keep the barrel. I boom, 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 boom like this and me to you, pow, I do it again. And boom, over he falls right there, eight feet. Just like, what a feeling, right? But the calling, the whole calling scenario and when to call was you had to feel it out as it went down. And you're gonna have to do this. And, and of course, one situation doesn't necessarily work. There's no rules, like deer hunting doesn't have rules. There's nothing that says it has to be this way. But you'll be able to feel that deer out and it's the deer's attitude that will really matter. And I, I judge the cover, I judge the wind, I also judge the deer's attitude and I want to feed them what they like. When you're turkey hunting, you feed whatever that gobbler gobbles at, you feed it to him, right? And he just loves it and you give him more, right? Well, kind of, it's the same thing with that deer. If the deer is really, ooh, I don't know. Do you want to call that deer a lot? There's no sense in calling to him a lot. If he's really reserved, you watch his reactions and he's really reserved about calling, you're not going to want to call that buck very much. Uh, Taylor and I, uh, two-step buck, which I'm pretty sure that buck's still alive and he'd be seven years old this year. We're going to go looking for him a little bit this year. He's got a big, huge wound on one side. Um, that buck we called to a lot and Taylor and I are tracking him and we jumped him and moved him 12 times in one day. So he is really on it. Anything that twitches that deer is gone. He is wised up. He crawls through ledges and goes through all kinds of stuff. We, in, in a two day period, we turned that deer into an animal. I don't know if anybody's gonna get him. I, I, I seriously question if anybody's ever gonna shoot that deer. He's so on it. We educated him so much. But he's had a break. We've given him a two year break here. But we went back and checked last year and he was still there. It's like, oh, that's good. He's still limping. Atta boy. So, we want to get back after him. He's going to be a deer where we call to him once maybe, maybe once, maybe twice, but probably not. The other kind of call that I sometimes do is just to scream, hey, 
I don't know how many deer I've stopped with a, hey, a human call. When you've already exhausted everything else and he hears something weird and he's running and you go, hey, I've had a whole bunch of them just turn on the brakes. What? I've had that work a few times and that might be some outside chance thing and I'm willing to try anything. I'm willing to learn from my mistakes or from my successes and I made a ton of mistakes. I'm an old dude, right? So you make tons of mistakes and, and if you're learning from it and you get rid of some of your rules in your mind and you just go by what the deer wants to hear um, and then continue that. Whenever the doe is being chased real hard, if she hears, say uh, they're in a little area you're tracking them, he's chasing, and they're in a swamp. Um, let's say the size of this show here, right? They're in this swamp and they've made a whole bunch of circles and you get in there. And say they, they, they finally, she's not ready yet, she can't outrun him, and she's just sick of him. So she lays down and he, okay, right? So he's hanging out with her and he goes over and has something to eat and he's covering her and then he finally says, okay, and boom, and he lays down too. If you come into that situation and you're calling like crazy and it, it's like, well, what should I call? Should I call like a doe? Should I use a tipper can? Should I use a, a younger buck grunt? Should I give it a big buck grunt? Like, you know, what would you do and how would you do it? You got to feel that out a little bit. Most of the time, if a doe has been being chased real hard and she's harassed a lot and you come along sounding like another buck, she freaks. Oh, another one. Whoa, and off she goes and guess where your butt goes ballistic with her and now you're in for another two mile walk or whatever it is or another three hours before you're near enough to actually hunt them again right so sometimes the does they don't want to hear another buck coming when they're being chased so the calling especially buck calling with the doe in tow or the does right there all the time she's deciding where this party is going to go and if you spook her you're just driving away your prize and he's going to go with her once in a great while i've had a few that left their doe and came over to deal with me most of the time it's a giant he's about the only one that can handle anything and i'll go deal with this and he'll come over and you can do that younger bucks especially they won't come over to you they're gonna stay right next to her. And if she does anything, away. So if you got like a four pointer and a, and a doe and they're doing their thing and you wanna get him, boy, you gotta be careful what you say. And it can't be anything that messes with her because when she leaves, she takes the prize with her. So there's always these situations where you have gotta do it. I use the terrain a lot to help cover me. If all of a sudden, um, say it's oak leaves, you're in Southern New Hampshire, you have no snow or anything, and you're just out and you're walking and calling, and you're making a little bit of noise, I try and keep it broke up some, walk a little, make a little noise, walk a little, make a little noise. Um, real crusty conditions, I'll do that too. Um, I'll try and mix a little bit of natural sounds with a little bit of calling and it'll buy you some time. And it, especially it'll buy you time with fawns. And most of the time if a doe has a pair of fawns, the fawns usually end up near you somehow. <laughs> They're just always right there. And of course fawns react the best to deer noises. They've never been through a hunting season. They don't know. I've called in a ton of fawns when mom was being chased by a buck and they've gone so quickly the fawn was left behind and I come along with a whole party and the doe is now finally picked an area where she feels safe enough to do a whole bunch of circling and she's right there circling and coming around and doing her thing and the fawn is tired now and I can't keep up with these two and they're crazy and I come along grunting the fawn just boom right to me that's because they're used to hearing deer noises and when they hear a little crunching and some grunting or a tipper can they'll be like oh there they are and it'll come running right down to you the closest I've ever been to a deer was a fawn that is comes running right up to me and the hind quarters about me to you and I took my barrel and I stabbed it in the hind quarter. That deer was standing right here. And I stabbed that thing with my barrel. I said, I always wanted to touch a live deer, right? And I almost went for it with my hand and then I'm like, nah, you better not. And I just poked it with my barrel, nice and gentle like that. That thing kicked like lightning and it caught my pant leg. Whoa, why was that fast? You have no idea how fast a deer can kick until you have one kick at you. My God, was that thing fast. And of course it wasn't expecting it and it, 
boom, sideways, just like that, and jumped right off and stopped here to the corner of the tent. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> I had no idea. It, it was so beautiful to be able to be that close to it. And it goes to show if you've got somebody young out in the woods with you or somebody who's not hunted before and you're on that scenario, the fawn, oh, hey, where are you, right? Plus, that's a confidence deer. If mom is out here circling around and you can have a confidence deer close to you, the other deer will feel good being around that other confidence deer, right? So that works so good. I use that all the time and that's kind of, that's some of it. This is kind of the thing you could talk about and, and go on about for a while, but um, I want to, you know, if you guys have any questions or anything, if I've stirred you up anything, I hope, I hope that's some information you can use. And uh, I'm kind of getting close on our 45 minutes here, but... Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. But if you do have questions, stop by the booth and uh, we'll be doing some more seminars at the shop um, coming in September. So thanks all for coming and hope you enjoy the show and uh, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. You bet. <laughs>